The reason that David Cameron is looking so busy is because Rishi Sunak has basically given up on foreign policy. He's only interested in Rwanda. Um, and so he's left this enormous vacuum. And as you said in, in, your, in, in your introduction, you get this sense that David Cameron's making hay, running around, burnishing his contacts book and, and rebranding the Cameron brand. And so you've got people like George Osborne on his blog saying, oh, you know, David Cameron's doing a wonderful job. Well, he's doing a wonderful job because Richie Sunak's not doing his. Our Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has really been in the headlines, A, because he's been very busy. He's definitely, definitely racking up the, the air miles. But there's, he's kind of split the critics in terms of um, how he's been doing. Um, cynics are saying, uh, actually, he's just doing all of this to kind of, you know, sort of rehabilitate himself after, you know, a, a, a not great end to his prime ministerial career and um, a difficult time uh, lobbying. But fans of his, and I actually interviewed Jack Straw, the former Labour Foreign Secretary on my show um, a couple of weeks ago, who he begrudgingly said he thinks David Cameron is doing a really good job as UK Foreign Secretary. Well, let's assess that um, now. Delighted to have um, his former number 10 comms chief, Sir Craig Oliver. Uh, Craig uh, is now a brilliant podcaster as well. And we have Con Conlon, who is defence editor at The um, Telegraph. Um, so, Craig, I'll come to you first. You, you obviously know Lord Cameron very well. You worked with him closely. How do you assess his time as, as foreign secretary? And what do you think his game plan is? Well, look, I was a bit surprised by your introduction there. Um, obviously, Con Coughlin has um, some pretty negative views about how the, David Cameron is doing at the moment, but he's pretty much a lone boy. So I haven't heard this level of criticism that you're talking about, other than from a piece which Con wrote in, in The Telegraph. So, look, I rather disagree. I think that we can probably go through each point point by point and explain why he's behaving in the way he is. But I do think it is very interesting, as you say, that significant Labour figures are quietly saying, actually, he's doing an extremely good job and he's carrying messages that are difficult and he's pushing agendas which are hard for other people to do. Um, OK, Con, let's come back with just your opening argument about why you have a slightly different view. Well, I, I, I personally think David Cameron's becoming a liability in, in world affairs. I mean, he doesn't have a great track record as prime minister, to be honest. When he was appointed foreign secretary, I was just reflecting on his great achievements as prime minister. And you have you know, the ruination of Libya, which is probably his greatest achievement as prime minister. Um, then you have the betrayal of the, the Syrian people with the, the disastrous Commons vote in 2013. And we haven't even got on to Brexit. So when it comes to foreign policy... Uh, David Cameron does not inspire confidence. And now, you know, since he's become foreign secretary, we've seen him uh, giving uh, Israel, which historically is a very close ally of Britain, a very hard time, um, at a time when Israel is fighting a war not just against Hamas, but against potentially Iran and all the other proxies. And now he's just had this disastrous visit to America where not only did the Republicans decline to see him, but so did the Biden administration. And he ended up giving this rather sickening speech, warning the Americans against appeasement when you know, the US remains the biggest military supporter of Ukraine against Russia. So, you know, be careful what you wish for with David Cameron. OK, I mean, you, you've set out your arguments. I think, to be fair, on the Syria vote, and I again, I say this out to good teeth, that wasn't just it. The, the Labour vote fell apart on, on that as well. I was actually working for yeah, like Ed I, Miliband. I think Ed, Ed I think, Miliband might yeah. be a bit more criticised on that point. And than David I, I made that point. Yeah, I, I, I'd accept the point. OK, um, Sir Craig. Well, look, I mean, look, Con obviously is entitled to his opinion, but I, I disagree with almost everything that he says there. The Syria point, I think, is very clear. I think on the Israel point, to say that you must dis defend Israel right or wrong 100% in the war against Hamas just simply is the wrong approach. It is pretty clear that Netanyahu's prosecution of his campaign in Gaza is losing a lot of supporters who would normally and naturally support Israel. It is deeply problematic. There are people who are being killed there who should not be being killed. And that is a very, very serious problem. David Cameron's bona fides on 
supporting Israel are unimpeachable. So, he has for a very, very long time been a friend of Israel. And like, it is appropriate that he says to an ally, look, you are getting this one wrong. I think Con is actually um, quite an unusual figure in suggesting um, that Israel should be supported 100 percent on what it's doing in Gaza. Well, Con's not actually saying that, um, to be fair to Con. What Con is saying is that Cameron's interventions on this issue have been deeply unhelpful. And in particular, uh, his, his suggestion that Britain would recognize a Palestinian state before any negotiations had taken place about what kind of state that would be. And given the dominance that Hamas has within the uh, Palestinian political structures, you, it's entirely conceivable that Hamas just like the Taliban in Afghanistan, How is uh, could end up being being the dominant player. So you know, but Con, I just don't Cameron's think he is saying that. I think that's a total misrepresentation of what he said. What he what he floated was the idea that in the future it could be possible to recognise a Palestinian state. A state. The operative word there is could to encourage moderate voices to come forward and take over. To say that David Cameron is saying that he would support a Ham Hamas led Palestinian state is total nonsense. OK, OK. That but, was uh, a clear indication he's given. It was that not. Is certainly, that is, that is nonsense. certainly how the Israelis have taken it. OK. And okay. It is how There's Netanyahu has taken it. There are many Israel, voices. And it's made his ability to have any kind of conversation with the Israelis in Jerusalem, very tainted. Okay, I'm just, sorry, okay. Colin, that is just total nonsense. It is how Benjamin Netanyahu may have taken it, but that view is not widely seen in Israel. And there are many voices who are supportive of Israel and within Israel who are saying that they think it is important that we try to find a solution to this problem that involves two states okay. that does of not course. involve... And, I, and, and we, all, we all support that. We all support... Uh, okay, okay. Gentlemen, I just want to... Um, intervene at this point. Look, Con, one thing that people are saying, and this is across politics, and, and as um, Sir Craig said, you know, there's many people on the left who are, are, are making this point, even though you might not uh, agree with some of the, the kind of positions that, that Cameron may be taking, he is a person who is of sufficient status, and he has been a world leader. And there's many people who are arguing that he is sort of opening doors and he's getting to see people in a way that his predecessor or, or other people who are in the cabinet, because it does feel like we're kind of, you know, on the sort of not just the B list, but the C list in terms of many of the, the people in, in, in the cabinet. And the other point that many people are making is he's really putting a shoulder to the wheel, like he is going everywhere. He is seeing everybody. He seems to be very committed to the job. Well, I mean, to, to use Craig Oliver's favourite word, that sounds like nonsense to me. I mean, you just have to look at um, his recent trip to Washington, where a, a scheduled meeting with the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, was cancelled. Um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives uh, uh, was supposed to see him. He cancelled that. So both, you know, his achievement in Washington last week, where he went with this great battle cry, free the aid for Ukraine, resounded in a total failure neither the republicans nor the democrats would see him so and the other the other point well, that's not true he saw blinken yeah but, yeah, but, but i mean that's he had, that, he, but he had to is see a big blinken, pick. i mean and then blinken. but he had to see blinken but in terms of delivering what he said he was going to deliver he failed miserably and okay think, well, not well, seeing I, the national security i mean, I mean okay on, let's on let's bring you like ukraine's but I, I just wanted to make one other point the reason that David Cameron is looking so busy is because Rishi Sunak has basically given up on foreign policy. He's only interested in Rwanda. Um, and so he's left this enormous vacuum. And as you said in, in, your, in, in, in your introduction, you get this sense that David Cameron's making hay, running around, bur burnishing his contacts book and, and rebranding the Cameron brand. And so you've got people like George Osborne on his blog saying, oh, you know, David Cameron's doing a wonderful job. Well, he's doing a wonderful job because Richie Sunak's not doing his. OK, let's bring Craig in. I mean, 
Connor, I just think that the arguments that you're using are extremely binary and do not accept that diplomacy is not a zero sum game. The reality is you cannot just blithely state that he went to the United States and say it was a complete failure when he spoke to the second most powerful person in the United States, Anthony Blinken. Also, going to see Donald Trump, he has been very clear and very critical on Donald Trump. What was Trump that about? The, Hang on, Con, let, well, let, let, Craig, yeah, let Craig finish. Con, let Craig speak. If you'd let me finish the sentence, you might hear. The point is, he went to see okay. Donald Trump having oh, having been very critical of Donald Trump in the past. He went to see somebody who is currently a serious candidate to be, to be president of the United States. Now, there are many people in the United Kingdom who would be very interested to hear what Donald Trump is saying in a private conversation. There is nothing wrong with going out there and finding out intelligence on what is actually going on. Uh, and and so, Craig, I mean, who like do you think he cleared that meeting with the, for example, you know, how do you think the senior people in the Biden camp felt about that that meeting? Do you think he did freelance it a bit going to see Donald Trump because he well, wasn't going to change Donald I, Trump's look, mind? Look, no, I don't think it is about changing Donald Trump's mind. It is about gaining intelligence on where he is and where his uh, where his actions are leading. I think, look, in politics, in public, people will take very, very strong binary positions and behind the scenes be very interested to know what he found out when he went and had a conversation with Donald Trump. It is not the same thing. And I think that the problem that I'm having with this conversation and the problem that I'm having with Colin Cochrane's arguments is they're incredibly binary. And they also seem to come from a place of saying that everything that David Cameron does is wrong. When many people on the left, as you say, yeah. including Mr. Campbell and Jack Straw, are saying he's doing a rather good job. And well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's an indictment in itself, frankly. Uh, the fact that, that David Cameron needs the support of the left for a Conservative Foreign Secretary. Can I just pick up on one important point with regard to Mr. Cameron or Lord Cameron's intelligence gathering activities in Washington? It is an iron law of diplomacy that you do not interfere in the internal politics of a friendly state. And that's precisely what Lord Cameron was doing last week with his jaunt to, to Mayalago. Uh, it's quite clear Cameron has no regard for Donald Trump. I mean, the things he said about him in the past, about his xenophobia, etc. I mean, you know, what, what on earth is he doing there? So, so then he goes to Washington and surprise, surprise, you know, none of the key players, the people who are running Congress, the people who are running national security, want to hear his intelligence. So it sounds to me like he's shot himself in the foot. And I'm sure okay. his Labour supporters are delighted at that. OK, Craig, what about that point about the, the things he'd said before about Donald Trump and the fact he, he had been pretty tough in his language about Republicans b beforehand and, and that maybe doesn't help the, the wider cause? There is an issue at the moment in terms of support for Ukraine about whether or not the United States is going to continue to the level that it is doing at the moment. There is deep international worry. Now, you can make the point that other countries should be stepping up more, but there is deep international worry that the United States is not going to do support Ukraine. And that is on a Republican side of the of the of the debate is having somebody of the international stature of David Cameron come in and make points about why it is so important that we continue to fund Ukraine is profoundly important. It's going to ruffle some feathers. It's going to worry some people, but it is a profoundly important thing to do. OK, we're coming to the end of our time. So just one quick question to to, to both of you. Um, finally, I mean, Sir Craig, I mean, I know, Con, you might find this difficult to believe, but there's a lot of people on the left who, even though they cannot stand David Cameron because of austerity and Brexit, do you think he's doing a, a really good job as foreign secretary? In fact, I've heard people on the left saying he's actually quite useful for the Labour Party in terms of what he's doing. I even heard a rumour, Sir Craig, of some people saying if Keir, Star if Keir Starmer wins, he should he should give David Cameron some kind of role. What, do you think there's any world in which that would happen? <laughs> No, I think there's no world in which that would happen. I think look, look, there can be a fantasy where we acknowledge that somebody's very good at their job and that they continue over across administrations that happens in the United States on a fairly regular basis. It's never going to happen here. But I do think it is testament to the fact that actually the settled will of most people in British politics is we've currently got a foreign secretary who's doing an extremely good job. OK, and final question to Con. Just on that final point, 
given, as you say, that Rishi Sunak seems to have abandoned all foreign policy about Rwanda, um, let's be honest, that the cabinet's not blessed with, you know, the 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 the, the greatest of, of political talent at the moment, Con, wouldn't you concede that David Cameron is doing um, the sort of the, the best job out of anybody that's around at the moment? And it's a good thing that he's taken a big pay cut to come and do this job and he's doing his bit for public service. Well, I just think he's become a liability. I think because because the Sunak down in streets has, has lost all interest in serious uh, political issues overseas, they, they've given it over to Cameron, who's running around, as I said, just making a lot of noise, but achieving very little.